we are delighted to introduce the nature of narratives. This session is presented by Rajasthan Patrika, novelist and academic, Sehkat Majumdar's exceptional works of fiction, The Scent of God, Silverfish, and The Firebird, are celebrated for their vivid imagery, haunting contemplation, and intimate portrayal of human life and longing. His novel, The Middle Finger, tells the story of a poet grappling with social boundaries and ethical and existential questions in sharp lyrical prose. Tanuj Sulanki, winner of the Sahitya Academy Yuva Puruskar and known for Neon Naun and Diwali in Muzaffar Nagar's stories return with a provoking novel on the impact of technology on human emotion and modern workplaces. The machine is learning. In conversation with Anukriti Upadhyay, both writers discuss form, expression, and invention in their chosen genre. Saikat Majumdar is a professor of English and creative writing at Ashoka University. He's also published a co-edited co collection of essays, The Critic as Amateur, Nonfiction College, and a book of criticism called Prose of the World. Tanuj Sulanki is the author of three books of fiction. His most recent novel, The Machine is Learning, was long listed for the JCB Prize for Literature 2020. Tanuj's short fiction has been published in The Caravan, The Hindu Business Line, DNA Out of Print, and several other publications. Anukriti writes fiction and poetry in both English and Hindi. Her English works, twin novella, Dora or Bhauri, and novel, Kin Sugi has been published by the fourth estate imprint of HarperCollins in India and have been nominated for multiple awards. Upadhyay has been awarded the Sushila Devi Award for the best work of fiction written by a woman author in 2020. Her Hindi works, a short story collection, Japani Sarai and novel Nina Aunty have been published by Rajpal and Sons. They will be signing their books, grab your copies, after the session on your left, and they'll be right there. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming um, to hear three writers talk about writing on a Monday morning. I'm delighted to welcome everyone um, to this session, and uh, particularly Shoykat and uh, Tanuj, who are extremely accomplished writers, as you just um, heard uh, Deepika say, but uh, the part that she did not mention is they are extremely thoughtful and discerning readers. I read their reviews and their comments about books with great deal of interest and an intent to learn. So, uh, you know, I'm going to turn this session into a masterclass on writing um, for, uh, for an apprentice writer like me, um, my benefit and everybody else's benefit too. It's not um, it's not common to get the two, uh, get two very fine writers coming from completely different backgrounds, completely different approaches uh, towards writing. Shoika, as uh, Deepika mentioned, is professor of creative writing. He is, um, his engagement with writing is on multiple levels. He teaches, he, he's a practitioner, writes himself, reviews, and does, oh, his preoccupation is around writing. Tanuj, on the other hand, is pretty much a self-taught writer and very accomplished one and that lives a different life, um, has a corporate career and um, uh, approaches writer writing from um, a, a very interesting perspective. So um, welcome both of you. You have very distinctive writing styles and very different thematic landscapes. At least that's how I felt when I read the Bali Muzaffarnagar and Machine is Learning by Tanuj and the Firebird and the Middle Finger by Shoykat. Um, you, I mean, it's, it's a gross generalization. They are very fine works, all four of them. But it almost feels to me that the emotional underpinnings of your work, Shoykat, and yours, Tanuj, stand at two ends of, of this, of the, from an emotional perspective. When I read Shoykat's work, especially the fiber, I feel despite it being a dark and fairly disturbing uh, novel at, at many times, I feel this 
urge or this longing for the place and the time you're writing for. It's not nostalgia because I've never lived it. And it's wrong to call it nostalgia. It's very evocative and attractive. So I want to, despite everything that was going wrong, want to go back and stand there outside the theater and watch the crowds go in and come out. Um, Tanuj, you on the other hand write about small town protagonists with a great deal of precision and almost cruelty. It's difficult for writers to be cruel to their own characters, right? We, we, we want you to, even if not like them, relate to them, but Tanuj does it with, you know, you take a scalpel and sometimes it's very sharp. Um, I admire you for it, um, but I can't say that I would ever be able to, to, to be, you know, in your shoes and um, present my characters so unbiasedly. So there are just, the, I feel that I feel a greater emotional engagement with Choi Kut's work and um, a, a, a sense of viewing things as they are happening on screen with Tanuja's work. So my first question is to you, Choi Kut. And you know, it's a very predictable one. So Professor Majundar, is writing an art or a craft or both? And to what extent can it be learned and taught? Um, whether learning writing, which many people say is intuitive, organic, or osmotic process, does it hamper the naturalness of expression? I would love uh, love for you to speak about it in the context of one of your works, the scent of God or the firebird, or you know, if you could tell us something about it. Thank you, Anakriti, for the question. And thank you for being here on a Monday morning. I know we are all getting back to work. I should say I'm especially honored to be you know, interviewed here by Anukriti, who I feel in many ways represents Rajasthan in her work, even though she writes in English, it's so vernacular. Something I think unites all three of us. We like to write about the vernacular, the local, even though we write in English. So that's a very important question you've asked. And uh, you know, I when you ask me that question, I think of a wonderful poem by Ted Hughes called Poets and Potters. And, um, and, and I think that in many ways summarizes, you know, why is pottery a craft and poetry an art? You know, what, what is the difference? What is the difference between art and craft? And I sometimes think that craft is simply comes from an older world where you work with your hands, which is rooted in community, which is very physical. Art, on the other hand, is something more modern, you know, with print culture, with a certain sense of his, history. Uh, and art also is very self-conscious. The artist thinks of the individual, you know, sort of more personal. And craft is something that is rooted in people. Of course, they melt. I think in the modern sense, when we talk about art and craft in a creative writing classroom, we think of craft as technical. And that I think is rooted in the fact that craft has a bodily thing, you know, and of course we who write, we are not sculpting things, we are not even painting, we are doing very abstract things. But I think the whole idea that, you know, what is the technical aspect? And um, I feel that you, you know, and this is a question a lot of sort of writers who are starting out ask me that, how do you know? And I think, you know, you just know when a motive, a theme, a story grips you, by your head and demands to be told. And there's a spontaneous element. There's a kind of wildness. There's a wild element about art. So for instance, with the firebird, I mean, I mean, you know, I was so gripped to tell the story of a child and his mother as an actress, and he's watching her on, on stage and where she's kissing another man or she's dying and he's terrified, like, oh, she's really dying. And some of that, of course, goes back to my own personal experience. My mother who died young was an actress. And I have some of these haunting memories of watching her as a five-year-old. She was dying on stage and I'm... maddening it's this environment of austerity and religion and yet in the middle of that young boys are coming of age sexually you know they are learning and and so for me often place is that wild call that i must be sort of in love with a certain kind of an atmosphere 
in that sense, the conscious element with my most recent novel, The Middle Finger was the most different because in some ways I wanted to do a campus novel, which is a contemporary retelling of the Drona Ekalavya story that what would it look like? That's a story I think all of us would teach the Drona Ekalavya story is a haunting reality for all of us. And I think we see that reality being played out at university campuses everywhere. You know, who gets access to the teacher? What is, what, how does it matter what your background is? And so in a way, this was a new to learn from that i'm going to carry that line back the character is the plot the character is indeed the plot whatever the character does is the story that we ought to tell sometimes we do start telling a story that we want to tell but the character may not want to tell it. so thank you for that uh, shoykat um tanuj uh, as shoykat mentioned your muzaffarnagar stories are really rooted in um the small town in the machine is learning, which I completely read uh, in, you know, with, I think it took me like a day to read it uh, because I wanted to find out what, where is this character going with his moral dilemma and his very practical needs. So where is he going? So um, that is a very modern urban novel. Of course, the hero comes from a small town. Um, I could relate to it as an ex-corporate employee, a, defector or a reform person, depending on which side you look at. But, and you kept it very contemporary, like Shoykat's uh, The Middle Finger, which has a lot of university campus happening. I actually learned about universities and liberal art campuses from your book. I now understand my son better who's going to a, a liberal arts uh, university. So yours is also very contemporary. You even have chapters in uh, text exchanges, yeah, chats. So uh, instead of dialogues, there are chats and um, they have the flavor of speech. It's, an, it's a telephonic, like it's a short communication. Uh, my question to you is, how do you approach your story? Like Shoykat said, character is the plot. How do you look at it? Is it, um, is it a more 
is it a more like constructed story outline approach or you let the story go the way it wants to go is it narrative what comes first what comes last it's a big question <laughs> thank you uh, anukriti uh, for me a story is is sort of like a vehicle for significance and what i mean by that is certain circumstances change and they lead to bigger change and the bigger change that they lead to in in characters lives of course are significant and they have to be significant for the reader uh, i think that is what a what a story does and uh, i published my first novel neon noon in 2016 and i was a, a you know Uh, no plot let's let's just follow this character and that novel is about a heartbroken man who actually goes to thailand on a on a sex trip thinking that sex will heal the heartbreak and but i've changed since then and uh, you know structure and plot have slowly become more important for me and uh, now when i when i actually decide to write a novel or even a short story i try to have a very very good idea of what is going to happen and i mean if if you just think of it in uh mathematical ways you know if if there are certain number of events that have to happen i need to know at least till the middle what is going to happen the ending i'm almost never uh, aware of or i've never never really planned for any particular story but i'm now more and more sure uh, of where this will start you know uh, what the first 3 4 5 chapters or events are going to be and uh yeah so that is that is what a story formation uh, is for me so in a sense what i'm saying is that i have i have the narrative voice pinned down i know who the narrator is going to be and i basically have have the structure of the work actually pinned down even before i start writing a significant amount of it now this was not true 5 6 years ago and therefore uh, in another 5 6 years you know the approach may change uh when i when i talk about that the machine is learning that particular chapter you know between the protagonist saransh and uh, jyoti uh it it boils down to uh, sometimes solving a problem right the, the two the, the plot is based i mean it's it's a romance in 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 many ways that novel you know and the two have to fall in love after uh af- after the initial bad uh, episode between them and but how do you solve that problem you know uh, so i had to like uh, you know really limit their interaction so there were not many pages for it uh so i could not really go into oh they met a second time here they met a third time here and etc cetera, etc cetera. so i thought about how do i basically use 30 pages and still convince the reader that this romance between them is 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 true it's coming from uh, uh you know coming from a place of authenticity for these two characters and then i thought about these people are in their late 20s and you know Uh, how do people in late twenties develop their emotional attachments? And the chat is a very, very big medium. So I, I thought of this chapter in chat will actually solve all you know my my very engineering level novelists problems, right? I, a few pages have to cover a lot of things. So the chats actually only denote the action that is happening in their real lives in 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 their actual meetings, right? So they let's say they are boyfriend and girlfriend. They meet. and then of course they go away but they continue chatting with each other and what you get as a reader is those chats you don't get details of uh, what happened in their meeting they are just suggestions to that and i thought i was very happy with it you know uh, so i thought hmm there is there is a very clear sense of the development of their relationships over successive chats over over two to three week period i think and by the end of that chapter i i feel that the reader is fairly convinced that you know these two have gotten along together uh, they are joking with each other some of those jokes are really uh, really really weird they are inappropriate and all that there are so i was i knew that if if it had to be realistic it needed to have some typos uh, you know and uh, so i would type things those chats on my phone and sometimes i made discoveries you know the auto correct turns up with really really amazing constructions so i decided to keep some of them 
uh, in that chapter. So yeah, so that particular chapter, the mode I chose for it is is very uh, it, it, it is actually the outcome of a problem solving sort of a thing. How how do I actually get past this hurdle uh, for these two characters? Uh, I going to what Saikat mentioned yes, uh, I mean just now about uh, art and craft. Uh, craft the way that I understand it because, and that may be unfortunate because in a sense, I don't come to it having understood it as a definition or as a, as a term. Uh, largely it's for me, it's about uh, what the sentence structures are going to be, how the micro events in the novel are going to follow each other. Am I going to keep a straight timeline for a certain time? Or am I going to, you know, interject a flashback here? Some of these things, and these may actually not be elements of craft. So I, I may be completely wrong here. Uh, this is what I understand as craft. And I think as you would have sensed, I bring a very uh, uh, engineer or a builder's mentality to, uh, to, to, to writing novels. And I mean, that's, that's how it works for me. <laughs> that's very interesting. Yes, uh, the engineering approaches identify the problem. There should be a problem statement, and then you come to a solution. And uh, just listening to you, Tanuj, I will never talk about my writing in front of you because it's extremely messy. I write in a notebook with a pencil, and sometimes I can't figure out with all the crossings and all the footnotes and all the diversions. So, yeah. You know the world of finance well, so you can bring in those metaphors. <laughs> Risks and claims, how did they turn into craft? So and that's that's would be our question for you on a critic. <laughs> that is so funny. I'm really flattered you. Um, so I usually explain my various worlds as I was, I'm not good at or perfect or very good at either of them. That's why I need all these in order to keep my self-worth intact inside me. But I would not dare to talk about craft in, um, in front of um, two of you. I, I do have a question, which in a way relates to my first question to you, Shoykat, which is, are, so can certain stories be only told in certain forms or with certain anchors? Now, my, out of the two um, works I've read of yours, my absolute top favorite is The Firebird. It's, yeah, I'm sorry to, uh, you know, say that. It's, it, writers, to be told I love your, like, this child better than that is not a, you know, happy thing to say, but I do. Um, the, the Firebird was a, a big emotional journey. I could not uh, not read it, and I, you know, I could not take a break. And it did affect me deeply, that relationship between the boy and his mother, a relationship that ought to be very close, but is because the mother is an actress and performing on, in, on the stage is, is that distant relationship as well. He's always seeking her. It's quite heartbreaking. So, so sorry, my question actually was, the theater is a metaphor for the messy way our lives happen. On the stage, it's one way. Behind the stage, in our minds, in our uh, psyche, it plays out differently. And I think the th theater mode have brought it out very well. The show is being put up, but in the green, the green room, something else is happening. So do you think that was, that's the only way to tell that story? There's like one right form for one story. That's a great question. Thank you. And I'm so moved by your reading of The Firebird. That means a lot to me. I mean, that novel does have a special place in my heart. I mean, we all, um, they have different places, different kids, we feel about them differently. But, you know, and the new kid is still learning to walk. But uh, I think, I mean, that one time, I, since I also teach creative writing, one thing I tell my students is that I think the most important thing when you're writing a story or a novel is the voice. You know, don't worry about what happens in it, but who is telling the story? You know, who is telling the story? And there's always a teller, even if there's not a first person narrator, there's somebody's always telling the story. What is their worldview like? It's like talking to somebody, you're hanging out with somebody, and do you like the person? This person makes jokes, they wander off, they forget, you know, they get very passionate, they have weird mannerisms, they scratch their head. I mean, you are actually hanging out with a person, and that voice is what you're hanging out with. You know, and if the voice is interesting enough, you don't really care what they're saying. I mean, all of you, all of us have conversations 
with people and we don't really remember what we talked about but we, that person left a mark on us because there was something very compelling about that persona so i always tell my and i know that you know i i my novel will take off it will start when i have that voice and you know the story is there and all but it's like a kind of a momentum thing it just uh, okay it's got its life now i'm fine now and now i need to just figure out the technicalities but the beginning part is very hard so that is something i tell all beginning writers that get that voice right that voice is a and i think with both the firebird and the scent of god i use the young protagonist you know the child protagonist the scent of god he's a bit older he's teenager it ends when he's 18 and what i love about writing through younger protagonist is that they are hit by powerful experiences but they don't know what it means so again just with the firebird you know a play is going on an adult is dying a child is too small to understand that adult is not really dying it's just an enactment you know and of course the the novel is about the confusion of art and life a kind of a willful confusion between art and life which society maintains when it comes to women so if you're an actress and if you're playing certain kind of roles or oh, your your character must be questionable and it also connects the tradition you know that actors actresses and prostitutes that sort of goes back to that lineage in red light areas in calcutta so there's that but most importantly is the child's confusion the child doesn't know what's happening and you know even with the center god it's like a 12 year old you're sitting in prayer you're singing a song your knees touching another boy and you have these strange feelings in your body that oh what is happening you know and of course it's a time when you don't know what gaze what straight is you know those things don't make any sense to you but you just know that body that thing is like you're watching a cricket match you know and then suddenly you hold your you know the sort of your friend's hand it's in a moment of excitement and then you're not letting go of that hand you know the fingers are curling against each other what is that so i was fascinated by the confusion of the child protagonist and my voice is in those novels were shaped by the confusion so that was my way of telling i mean that's why middle finger was a challenge because it was an older protagonist it's somebody like us who teaches at university who writes who understands and i was like i'm not going to be able to do this i i am like the child writer i i can't have a protagonist who understands what's going on i'm going to write a very boring book i mean hopefully he has it i mean hopefully you know i i enjoyed writing witty dialogues it's a more global cosmopolitan novel than my previous ones which are very much suited but it was a big departure and the main reason i was nervous was the voice that i'm going to speak in a voice i haven't done before this is new for me so voice and form i think you asked really important questions and i think you know also certain novels are haunted by certain forms like with the firebird i knew theater is going to be the inspiring genre for this novel as a writer who writes only prose i'm really fascinated by art forms which have performative lives you know you write so beautifully about songs in your in your work you know and i'm fascinated by that and obviously because i have this relationship with theater growing up in green rooms you know after the play going and seeing my mother you know she's got rid of her makeup but she's got this wig and i'm like is that my mother or is it not like she looks like my mother but she doesn't really and she's not really she smile looks very strange so i know this i remember these feelings you know and so in some ways i knew that theater had to be the force the and, and theater more than film because theater has this physicality you know what does it feel like when you watch a play from the wings from the darkness of the wings you know what does it feel like what does it feel like when you watch something from the green room as opposed to sitting there so i was in a way that was something and i also realized that prose is a very modern form it is a very rational form it is rooted in print culture it is a very bourgeois form but theater is a much older form it is primitive it is almost savage it's almost barbaric if you think of greek tragedies shakespeare tragedies there's something wild about it and i think you know the reason you know firebird appeal to some people as you're saying very kindly is that i somehow managed to bring the sort of performative energy of theater into a kind of a more calm and rational genre of the prose and that i didn't think i could do it because these are very contradictory things but as you know many chapters of the firebird are actually theater scenes 
there are theater scenes and i'm in any case a scene driven writer i don't do a lot of oh five years past and i'm i just show scenes this is what happens and when I think I have a moving scene and encounter. I feel I'm done. I can move on to the next thing. That's all I care about. I don't care about. So in the same way with middle finger, it was poetry. I was fascinated with oh, what does poetry sound like? Poetry reads in a certain way. When you read poetry, when poetry is read out, what does it feel like? What is spoken word like? What happens when a poet hears their word being performed in a pub? You know, they're, do they feel a sense of shame? Do they feel a sense of pride? Do they feel a sense of ownership or somebody else taking away their words? What happens, especially when your poetry is very political and this character is writing poetry. This first part of the novel is set in the US and she's writing poetry about blackness. She's po writing poetry rooted in the racial experience. And she's haunted by the anxiety that, do I have the right? Am I being authentic? Am I being a fraud? And then when you hear that perform, so I think at, it's a kind of a romance I have as somebody who only works with the written word. I'm fascinated with the idea of performance. Of course, we perform in situations like this and I perform in classrooms, I'm a teacher, but the way poets perform, the way playwrights perform, the way musicians perform, you know, I'm fascinated by that. So I think, you know, to kind of sort of end, end my response to a question, I think form, voice, they are claimed by this shapeless thing that comes to you, or oh, this is what is going to be. And then it sort of, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beast. You know, funny thing about writing is that, you know, it's really working when you're losing control. When the characters are going out of control, when they're doing their own thing, they're not listening to you. That's when you know a novel is actually taking shape. You know, I mean, I know Tanuj has a much more pragmatic, he has an engineering background and I respect that fully. He likes to be in control. And in some ways, I also think a lot about form because I teach writing. But at some level, it's about losing control. You know, can you, because you can't write about anything human and retain control over it. Characters will run away from you. And that's when, you know, it's, you know, you know, it's, you've, you've got the form, right? And it happens sometimes, sometimes it doesn't happen. I've written 100 pages of novels and it seemed, it was very hard. It didn't work. I, for the longest time, wanted to write something from the perspective of a domestic worker because I'm fascinated. I, I returned to India after living in the West for many years and I was fascinated by the kind of intimacy of labor which domestic workers have. And I wanted to write that. And yet when I wrote it, the voice was so bourgeois, I just discarded all of that. But in the middle finger, because of the Drona Ekalavia connection, I was inspired to speak you know, in that voice. So I think for me, the voice is very important. That's, um, that, that has given me, again, a lot of food for thought. I, if I wouldn't have known that the firebird and the middle finger are written by the same author, the, the voices are very different. The prose reads different because of the difference in the voices. Um, and uh, now I see that the focus is the voice and the voice actually probably constructs the story as it goes along in many ways. Um, clearly the- There are different kinds of writers, just briefly. I mean, there's someone like D.H. Lawrence and Wolf. D.H. Lawrence's novels have a sameness, you know, they, the same. But if you look at someone like James Joyce, Joyce, I think, gave his novels over to his characters. So it's almost like, oh, the whole idea Stephen Dedler saying, God pairing his fingernails. So we don't know. So even in Ulysses, the parts narrated by Stephen are totally different from the parts narrated by Bloom because Stephen is very conscious, very artistic, very elevated. And Bloom is like this really coarse, grounded guy. He thinks about, you know, farts and shits and body odors and he's very so the language is very choppy so Joyce gives it over and I've, I've now realized these are things you don't realize but after having published four novels I realized that I'm more of a Joycean writer that I give my voice to a particular story I don't have a constant voice I may have stylistic elements that run through my work but the voice is always invented by the particular novel that's interesting I think that also makes the story very authentic and different in feel each book very different. I went to Kolkata in, in the Firebird and I went to the university campus in uh, uh, the Middle Finger. So um, yeah, I, I think that's another learning I'm taking away. For, for my question for you, Tanuj, is also related to contemporary. Your stories are all contemporary. They depict the reality as it is. You know, you, it's not, you don't want to show 
um, as I often wish to, uh, to soften it, to craft it, in order for it not to be so hurtful. But you, you have no illusions. You write, you, you write from a very deep place of lived experience, and you are able to use that experience creatively, which is often, you know, a challenge. How far you are into a place, uh, in, into your um, story, and how far you stand apart from it as a creator is always, it's always a dilemma, right? How much of you goes into it? So. I, I thought in the machine and also in all stories in Muzaffar, there's like this preference for first person narrative because you are coming from that place. So is that the reason like you write from your personal experience and you feel first person narrative is the most, uh, is the best way to bring, to tell those stories? Uh, is that the reason or have you toyed with other narratives and decided, okay, this is the one that works for my stories. Just as Shoykat was saying that, you know, once I find the voice, then um, the novel is there, the work is rolling. Thank you for the question, Arukriti. Uh, so in Diwali in Muzaffarnagar, there are eight stories. And if I recall correctly, I think two are in third person, two or three, I don't remember. And other than that, my two novels are in fact in first person, but this is just as far as I think uh, an accident till date. And I think in, in the future, there will be works in, in, in all kinds of voices. Uh, so, I mean, your point about reality, right? Uh, I like, as, as you mentioned earlier, that I'm a bit cruel to, to, to my characters and I like to put them in, spots of real helplessness that's that's what i like to do and i find that reality itself provides these these situations where where people feel helpless i mean who among us has not felt helpless uh, in, in in certain situations that there's no way out i i like to catch characters when they are precisely in such situations so uh, some of the ca main characters in diwali in muzaffarnagar for example this this filial obligation that they feel from earlier generations who continue to reside in the small town of Muzaffarnagar and the lure of the metropolitan life, you know, the conflict between the two, many of, for many of the characters, that itself is the co conflict. And that sometimes, and most of the stories, if you, if you actually think about them and analyze them, right, there is this inextricable situation or a home calling uh, that happens. Right, that Muzaffarnagar calls these characters from these lives that they are living in Delhi and Mumbai, and when they go home, in, in whether in their minds or or actually they visit home, they realize that the filial obligation that they have somehow been able to divert their lives from is actually real. It it is going to pull them back, and some of them actually accept it towards the end. You know, the, the, they actually one of the characters in the story, Compassionate Grounds she actually decides to move back to Muzaffarnagar, you know, because her circumstances have changed like that. So that has been there, even with uh, the machine is learning, for example, uh, the machine is learning is the story of uh, th this man who works in, a, uh, in an insurance company. And he's actually doing a project that he knows will result in, in the loss of employment of uh, around 550 people. Right, and somewhere in in the process of executing this project, uh, there is there is this voice of conscience that starts speaking uh, to him with him, and but the helplessness truly is that he can't do anything about it, right? I mean, how do you rebel? Uh, you're you're part of an eight thousand, ten thousand, uh, uh, you know, member organization. Uh, how do you actually rebel? How do you make the organization stop? from doing what it is going to do, right? With or without you. And so there is an attempt at a sort of rebellion by this, by this person, but of course it leads to nothing, you know? And, and there's this helplessness. Of course, he has to walk away from that set of people, but what was going to happen, the cruel thing that was going to happen is, is, is actually going to happen anyway. And I think I'm at this point sort of attracted to, uh, to the certain helplessness uh, that that characters feel this inextricable situations that people find themselves in and all of us uh, find ourselves in. Uh, and about reality again, 
So my work actually includes a lot of dream sequences. You know, almost every story or every work of fiction includes those those sequences where I allow myself this, you know, thoda sa bahar jaake, thodi der ke liye let's let's get out of reality and let's let's imagine if this character in this particular situation, if they were going to dream, what their dreams could be, and sometimes those dreams are not connected with the with the situation; they are completely arbitrary, as dreams tend to be. Uh, in my novel, the first novel, Neon Noon, actually there is a strong element of hallucinating. You know, the main character is is in Thailand in Pattaya, and he's addled by alcohol and 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 sex and whatnot. And he act. This is a man in his mid twenties or late twenties, and he actually sees a person, and he he actually believes that this person is his son. Uh, and and that sort of hallucination happens. So. So I am, you know, I'm not beholden to the world, the real world as as it is. I think reality itself morphs its definitions according to, as Saikit said, the character that you're exploring and the voice that uh, you're exploring it in. One, one, one point that I want to make is, uh, I think it is often said very, very casually that, uh, especially to you know young people who, who who want to become writers or have just started their journey, that find your voice, you know. I think uh, often the mistake that is done with that is writers actually don't have a voice. It is the narrators uh, for each of their works for which they have to discover a voice. You know, a writer can have a style, and style is often the the series of imperfections that one sentences are are mired by. You know, that's that's Orhan Pamuk's way of looking at styles. He calls style imperfections, right? And I think he's talking mostly about the visual medium of painting, etc. But I think some amount of that also carries to, to text or, or to writing itself. So voice is not something that a writer develops. Voice is something that you develop for a particular telling. Okay, for that you have to find a voice, and therefore a writer over a period of time, ten years, twenty years, thirty, forty. I mean, whatever number of works they produce, they are going to have to do this every time. Every time you write a story, you are going to have to find the voice for the story, or in certain cases, or in polyphonous works, multiple voices for the same story. So I, I'm sure Sh uh, Shaikat also meant the same. But just for everyone, it's not writers don't have voices, narrators, or people who tell. I mean, people in your novels or stories who are actually the narrators, for them you have to find a voice. That's so interesting. That. Um... A, a professor of creative writing and a self-taught accomplished writer both say the same thing writing is at the end of the day finding that voice like shaikat said once that voice is found the book is there and you you also say the you know with with probably a just like a different way of putting it that uh, every book has its own voice you just go out and find it I see we are running out of time, but I do have one more question for Shaikat, which I can't not ask, which is the three mistakes. The three mistakes that writers make, please tell us. Well, that's an easy one. I mean, I think for fiction, don't worry about plot. I think for beginning writers, the challenge is, oh, I have this great story. You know, it doesn't matter. The story doesn't matter. Don't get into the trap of just having a plot and then put characters there. It's always the other way around. You know, plot is what Aris plot is what characters do. This is something Aristotle says a long time back in Poetics that, you know, praxis. It's pl plot is character, character. And if you think about it, character is never just a static thing. No human being is. There's no Platonic idea of me. You know, there's you at home. There's you at office. There's you in a relationship. There's you in you know whatever you eating you're having sex you're you're always in a situation so character in a situation is what you want and sometimes i tell my students that you know try with characters you know you know try with your family and even a lot of my students are 19 20 year olds they haven't had a lot of life experience i said you don't have to do anything the indian family is a stuff of epics it has, epics have literally been made and you can write an epic based on that. So just take your family members. They may not be very happy to read your stories. You know? <laughs> Usually these are not flattering, but is your mom reading your stories? Is your... So it's, that's a different debate. And try something. Put the character in a new place. Take a character you know, but create a new situation for them. You know, okay, just to give a kind of a bad example, your mom maybe is a homemaker. Maybe she doesn't go out. 
what if she was working what would she be like if she was working what if your dad was staying at home and looking after the house you know just so you know the characters but you know so this is how fiction gets made you know i mean for me at least i need a seed of reality i need a seed of reality but that seed can grow into a forest that seed can create trees which can become a forest but i need that one seed i mean i have great respect for writers of science fiction or speculative reality who don't need any of that but i am not one of them i i find reality too fascinating i think there's so much magic in the real that you don't need to really invent reality as such so i think that's one you know one uh, you know, i think don't worry about that it's not a formula it is not about but it's really the organic nature of character and voice and personally for me atmosphere that i don't think has to be true for everybody but i think for me you know this is exactly why i like your work or tanuj's work is that it gives me the sense of a certain place it the character the voice is not just something air lifted from above but it grows like a sapling from the ground from the soil itself and i'm very drawn to fiction like that which is actually fiction embedded and that's also why you know middle finger was a challenge because it was a diasporic in you know, a person moving around and even then i realized that even people who move around they form they have relationships with places that are constantly evolving it's not the same so for me that's very important so my my advice would be you know don't worry about plot plot is the least important thing plot will happen you know know the character know where they're authentic push them in new directions and you'll see it will come together i mean you will of course have to have some kind of a structural mapping but i think this is a very common mistake writers make to think that a story is about plot it's not about plot thank you um thank you very much it gives me so much consolation i also have a trick of writing when i can't solve something i go um cook a dish or try to take a nap usually things resolve when you are doing something else <laughs> i know tarun wanted to um sorry tanush wanted to add yeah, to actually something, I have something completely contrary to say to cycle <laughs> a plot is important according to me but i think we will end up saying the same thing uh i think often the mistake and uh, my experience is slightly different in the sense that i i have been editing a ma fiction magazine for 8 9 years and often i find that the mistake that that happens is that the conviction that my plot is fantastic is actually is actually the bigger problem you know uh, and uh, so typically the advice that i give uh, is that try to write the main three events uh, in, in your plot and let's make it triple that you know let's let's add two times more events and let's see where we are going and i think that is where we are saying the uh, we, we are saying the same thing but yeah but the <laughs> yeah, completely agree. i mean i it so happens that my novels end up actually being quite plotted i don't write novels which are plotless they're actually end up being quite plotted there is kind of a often it with the firebird i think it's a clear storyline all i'm saying is that that's not what the novel starts with the plot kind of emerges the plot emerges as you move along i think finding things like voice and character is much more important and then it sort of what this person might do if they're in a situation like that so i mean some novels are more plotted some are not but i think i think that organic connection between plot place and character is very important sometimes i feel like oh this plot was there they're just looking for characters you know the i mean six characters in search of an author but you know a plot in search of a character is not a good formula for a novel <laughs> That, that is again deep, deep interest to me. Um, I have learned so much here, and I, like I mentioned earlier, I was going to enroll in a creative writing program. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to uh, request the JLF uh, organizers to have more of these panels and let me moderate them. I would love to yeah, continue this conversation. Unfortunately, I think we are at the end of our time. However, uh, Rajasthan Patrika, who's very graciously sponsored this um, session. um have sent us a couple of questions from um uh, their readers uh, they they have a rajasthan patrika knowledge series where readers engage and i'm so happy to know that readers engage so deeply with reading and writing um the questions actually have really been already answered in this session so which which shows that we were going in the right direction this is what this is the stuff that people wanted to know i'll just sort of read them out and if you have any thoughts shoykat shoykat and um tanuj please do Um, sort of uh, respond to these um so the first question is that the stories um 
you know, they turn into stirring novels on human emotions and impact of technology on modern places. I think this is referring to both yours and uh, Shaikat and yours, uh, Tanuj works. They, you know, modern as well as emotional expressions, reactions to our times. Um, I, I think the question there is that, you know, how does that transformation happen from all the chaos that we see and experience, you know, where the stories come from, which I guess both of you have been talking about. The second one is, um, that the same kind of uh, literature and writer are recognized, uh, you know, and they're talking, the question also speaks about literature based on religion and uh, saying that anything you write about religion could be targeted as being against the culture. And I know the middle finger, I, I uh, sort of thought that the religion of one of the protagonists was, it, it, it was an interesting element. and. I almost thought could be to further discussion um, in that religion really did come into play and develop the novel. So, so I guess the question, the, the question really is religion, talking about religion is considered anti-culture. Does that pose a constraint? Um, I don't know whether the two of you would like to respond to her. Huh? I think we have a minute each, sorry. Uh, I, I'll just quickly take the first one. Uh, Technology is, yeah, we are out. Okay. We can, we can take this question elsewhere. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So uh, technology is transforming our, our lives, but so little of it is actually, actually finds a space in fiction, right? We, we don't really talk about what's happening inside big corporations, what they're to, doing with technology and what the impact of it will be. So with machine is learning, my attempt was to, to kind of bring it into fiction. That's the short answer to, to, the, to the first question. I'll be very brief too. I mean, I, I'm not a believer. I don't define myself as a believer, but I'm fascinated by the power of religion to inspire art, music, art, sculpture, architecture. I'm really fascinated by that. So my last two novels, I mean, The Scent of God is set in a Hindu monastic boarding school and obviously queer relationships in there. So I, I was very drawn by the eroticism and sensory nature of Hinduism. And I had to create that the color saffron becomes a very magnetic color. And in the middle finger, of course, it was the church sermon, Christianity, what Christianity, the impact Christianity has on tribal characters. And I was fascinated by the genre of the church sermon when you speak in church, right? It's a very poetic form. So in many ways, the poetry there came out through this genre. So I'm really fascinated by the way religion inspires people to create art. Sorry, we're being told that we are run out of time. I'm so sad because I wanted to um, hear more, but thank you so much, Shoykat, and thank you so much, Tanuj. For me, definitely, this has been a learning and experience. Thank you, Anakriti. It's a delight to be in conversation with you. It's a privilege. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Shoykat Majumda, Tanuj Solanki, and Anukriti Upadhyay. We'd like to thank Rajasthan Patrika for this support. They will, all three of them will be signing their books. So you can ask for questions as well. If you have any, get your copies and they'll be right here signing.